This is Linda Pinizzato, the condo expert, speaking to you from the studio over here at the Hayes FM. You know, it, it's interesting. In the last uh, few episodes, uh, we've always had guests coming in, and, and we've spoken to a lot of different guests, actually. We've spoken to Metrolinx, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, Carson Dunlop Home Inspections. Uh, we've had mortgage brokers in. We've actually had condo owners who are experiencing a ton of problems right now. And we've also had a director from the Condo Owners Association. Today we're going to start a different set of series here, and I really want all condo owners and homeowners and general public to stay tuned. The Condo Expert, what we're going to do is we're going to provide you a total in-depth education on the Condo Act. As you know, the Condo Act is on review right now. The provincial government in June of 2012 made the decision to build a better Condo Act. Also, myself, Linda Pinizzato, I created, I'm the founder of the Condo Owners Association. And I want to give you a little bit of a history on COA itself. Back in April of 2009, I became party to the Trinity Spadina area. And at the time, the local MPP was actually thinking of creating a mechanism, an association that would represent his riding almost like a ratepayers association, to work with him on a private member's bill. The private member's bill did get approved. I mean, it's been about, uh, I think, two or three of them had gone through. And what happened was is that the attempt was made. I mean, I made a very valid, strong attempt to move forward and, and try to make a difference. Even though Trinity Spadina, which is, which is actually in the neighborhood of if you take the borders from Young Street over to Dufferin and you go from Lake Ontario pretty much up to maybe Bloor, I'm, I may not be exactly, but that's the general locality. Within that area, there's about 60,000 condo owners. Today, it's probably gone up to at least maybe 75 to 80,000 only because, you know, there's been a massive, massive amount of construction of high-rise condominiums in that entire neighborhood. I mean, the downtown entertainment district has been absolutely inundated. Right now, as a matter of fact, uh, there's quite a bit of controversy. Uh, uh, we are working, COA is actually working very close with um, Mike Yen, who is the founder of the Trinity Spadina Ratepayers Association. And uh, Mike and I know each other very well, and we've worked together on a number of issues, and he has supported COA, and he's actually just recently put out the first uh, news uh, magazine. And we were given a full page, COA has been given a full page, just to let all the people in Trinity Spadina know uh, that there is a new ratepayers association. And why was that necessary? Because in that neighborhood right now, Adam Vaughn, the local councillor, has actually been supporting a, an extensive amount of growth and a lot of the area residents are extremely concerned about height restrictions that are kind of falling down the wayside and they're also concerned about heritage buildings being knocked down i.e. restaurant row. So Al Carbone, uh, the gentleman that owns Kit Kat right down, downtown on uh, King Street, has been working extremely hard and, and even with the support of the local BIA to try and you know, make changes so that this doesn't continue to happen. I mean, we have so much character in that neighborhood. It's it's just absolutely beautiful. And to turn it into a, to a total community of residential high rises that are now going from, you know, 40 stories, 50 stories when TIFF came in and potentially 80 stories for the Mervish building to come in is really not cohesive to what a lot of people in the area wanted. So not to get sidetracked, but that will show you where the concerns came all about and where it all started, I guess, back in 2009. In March of 2010, I personally moved forward and registered the Condo Owners Association Ontario in order to advocate and represent condo owners across the province and we would have divisions within all the cities across the province. So therefore, you know, Toronto is a division of COA Ontario. Mississauga is a division of COA Ontario. So you have COA Mississauga, COA Toronto, COA Sarnia, COA Ajax, COA Hamilton, Windsor, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ottawa, and so on. So to date, we've already established 27 
different condo owners associations across the province. And of course, we are looking for volunteers who are interested in being a committee uh, members of each of the different COAs. What I'd like to do is draw your attention very quickly to www.coaontario.com or you can go coaontario.ca or you can just type in Condo Owners Association as well. So basically, that's the structure and it's incredibly important for our province to understand, all the, all the residents in our province to understand how important the Condo Owners Association is to work with political government and work in the whole mechanism of trying to make changes so that we have a sustainable future and we have a very strong community within condominiums. And that means governance. It means proper direction of how the whole condominium situation works from the board of directors to the residents to the condo owners to the investors and so on. From the time that March 2000 and, uh, 2010 came about, it has been, if, if I wanted to say that I've, I've taken a challenge, I will tell you that this is the biggest challenge I have taken in my entire life. I mean, I've been involved. I'm, I am a realtor. I've been a realtor for 33 years, and I'm a government relations chair for the Mississauga Real Estate Board and on the government relations committee of the Toronto Real Estate Board. And, of course, because of that, I represent and work with the Ontario Real Estate Board, the Canadian Real Estate Board, Plus the fact that I know about condominiums, having been a president of the board of directors for two condo buildings, downtown Toronto, for a total of 17 years, and also having gone through two buildings from day one when you come through the registration period, which we'll get into a little bit more, going through all the tarry-on warranty periods of a brand new condominium and recognizing what kind of impacts and what kind of problems could come about and how important it is for a board of directors, brand new, coming into the picture, they need to have some degree of information presented to them so that they know what to do and they know what to ask for. They cannot just depend on the property managers. So basically, the bottom line of our show, just to give you the big intro, is to get into the guts of the whole thing. We need to rock the whole situation. Everybody out there needs to know what's going on. So the provincial government, the McGuinty government, in June of 2012, moved forward and said, we need to build a better condo act. Let's start the review. So Minister Margaret Best which we met with, and COA actually previous to that, in 2010, we met, we uh, worked with uh, Minister Sophia Angelinitis. In 2011, we worked with Minister John Gerritsen. 2012, we've worked with Minister Margaret Best. And now, of course, we're waiting for our first appointment with Minister Judy McCauley, who's now been appointed by Premier Wynne, because they did make a change. We're a little bit confused with the change, we have to say, because, you know, I mean, Minister Best had already driven into the the depth of everything and had a very good understanding and took the time to go around and have different meetings with the general public. So why the change? We really are looking forward to that meeting so that we can understand why it was necessary midstream of an 18-month review to all of a sudden make a change of ministers. We will be back to you on that answer as soon as we have that uh, meeting with the, with the new Minister McCauley. Now, in the meantime, please take time, tell your friends, tell everybody about this show. I think it's probably going to run about maybe three to four sessions, so that'll be over a three to four week period. You can t- tune in on Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Uh, it's a one hour show, Friday evening, 7 p.m. And uh, we will soon have this on podcasting, which will be right on the Hayes website. So now let's get started. Did you know there is a condo act? You know, people drive along, and I've mentioned this a few times on our show. You know, we have a municipal act basically geared towards how the different municipalities operate with relation to the province. We have a traffic act. You know, if you're on the street, you have you haven't stopped at a stop sign or you're speeding and the police have pulled you over, you are getting fined in accordance with the Traffic Act. And then, of course, you can decide to go to court or however you want to plead. But the bottom line is, is that the infraction is in accordance with the guidelines of what the Traffic Act says. 
and that's how government is able to kind of set legislation forward and mandate certain things. So the Ontario Safety Act would be under that as well. Maybe the Accessibility Act would be under that. So you can go through all the different, the Planning Act. I mean, there's just so many different acts that comprise together to to indirectly create law and they create legislation. The Condominium Act, the one that's in place right now, was actually revised in 1998. So every single condominium across the province of Ontario is indirectly all of the paperwork that's ever been done regarding those buildings are supposed to be in compliance to the Condominium Act of 1998. Now that actually would include any brand new development. So if you if you think about condominiums, if you, if you go into a sales office tomorrow and say it's a high-rise building that's going to be built, that builder, okay, would have had his lawyers draw up a draft of a declaration, the declaration, which is almost like the Bible of the condominium building. So they would have drawn up the declaration, and in that declaration, it will give you all the guidelines of how that corporation, the condo building, which is now a corporation, operates. Okay, now when that declaration is drawn up, of course, it has to reflect the Condo Act. But what has been found out is that the Condo Act does not have the strength, even sometimes, to hold water in Superior Court. Not only that, condo board members have moved forward to make changes to those declarations, or possibly there could be things in the declarations that may not be to the best interest of condo owners. And of course, you know, there's been a lot of changes going on. In 1998, I mean, that's a, that's a long time ago. We're looking at uh, over a decade here. I mean, 14 years later, we're reviewing a condo act. Yet meanwhile, in 2002, we had substantial growth of condominiums across the province. We've had reported by Canada Mortgage and Housing that over half of construction today across the province are condominiums. That's what they are, is condominiums. Now, let's just stop for a moment and say, okay, condominium, what is a condominium? A condominium can be an apartment building. I mean, that doesn't matter whether it's going to be five stories, it's going to be 15, 20, 30, 40, even 80. That's a condominium building. You have a condominium townhouse self-explanatory. Stack townhouse, the difference between a regular townhouse and a condo stack townhouse. Condo stack townhouse really is just, you know, uh, a low-level condominium where you may have a two-story unit and then above that you have another unit and another unit. So so basically you have a, a condominium complex that has two-story units on top of each other that are more running kind of like a townhouse as opposed to an apartment but they're not single or one or two stories. They could be six stories, but that's going to be three units all on top of each other. So that's kind of a stacked townhouse. But then you also have the commercial entity. So you have commercial strip plazas. You could have a commercial medical building where they've allowed. Now, I know here in Mississauga, for instance, there's one up on um, Aramos Parkway in Eglinton on Credit Valley, not too far from the hospital. And that's actually where... It, they have a, a stipulation that if anybody buys in there, they can only rent out to someone in the medical profession. And that, of course, would be in accordance with their declaration because that's the type of building it has. Uh, it was created as when it was first built. So with condominiums, those are the varieties. You can also have what's called as a conversion. So in other words, Years ago, you know, you had an apartment building in the neighborhood. People were renting it. It's just a standard residential rental building. And now the owners of that rental building have decided that they want to convert it. So they're they're not building from scratch. It's not new construction. They're taking an existing building that could be, you know, 20, 25, 30, 40 years old, whatever the case may be. And they're converting it. And they're going to be converting it into a condominium. Now, the reason I'm going to mention that one is, is that on new construction, all new construction across the province falls under the new Home Warranty Act. And what that would be is the Tarion. And Tarion, just no different from a house, Tarion gives you warranty coverage on brand new construction. 
whether it be a townhouse, whether it be a condo building, whether it be, you know, a regular freehold house, semi-detached, detached, whatever the case may be, new construction falls under the new home warranty act. Therefore, the tear-in warranty applies. Unfortunately, beware for everyone out there, if you're purchasing a property that is a conversion unit, conversions are not covered under tear-in warranties. Now that's an important thing to think about because these buildings, uh, you know, interior wise, they may look absolutely beautiful. They've got new laminate flooring. They've got, you know, fantastic, um, you know, stainless steel appliances. Uh, you know, everything looks really pretty. It's fresh. It's new. It's great. However, the structure of the building, which means your foundation, your existing exterior walls, your roof, your mechanical system, all of those very, very important and expensive features of this building are not covered under the Terion warranty. So when you go in and purchase a conversion unit, I, the condo expert, would personally suggest move forward and get yourself an inspection. Now that's a tough one because they may, they, they'll allow you to inspect the unit you're purchasing. The question is, will they allow an inspector to go in to inspect the actual building. And that's where the expenditures come. The other problem is with the conversion unit, and not to get too much into this because I don't want to get sidetracked, but, but I'm just going to hit one small point. And on another series, we will cover more extensive things with conversion units. But remember, you know, these buildings, they're older. So they're not going up, they're going wide. So they cover more land. So with more land, you have more foundation. With more land, you have more roof levels. So there's more intricate things that you have to watch for. When you go up, it's cheaper for the builder. I mean, he has to use less land and he goes up, especially nowadays when they're using more glass than they're using concrete. Point of information, please move forward. You're looking at conversions. You have no protection. So honestly, due diligence, watch what you're doing. Pay attention, you're, you're buying something that's awfully expensive and you want to make sure that you do have some degree of protection. You don't want to go into this unit and find out in four months' time that all of a sudden the whole place needs a new roof. So getting back to the Condominium Act. The Condominium Act, which anybody out there, just if you're looking for it, you can go into the COA site. We have it right in there. Click on it, read it. It's not the easiest thing in the world to read because unfortunately it has been prepared by lawyers and it's somewhat very confusing. However, try your best, pick out key points and uh, do some research and certainly stay tuned to the condo expert here on the Hayes FM. So the condo act being in relation to the declaration. Now we'll stop for a moment and we'll think about that declaration. So the declaration as I mentioned, has been prepared. So it's the Bible of the building. Every single condominium out there will have a declaration. As a matter of fact, if you go tomorrow and you buy a condominium, you should have a clause in your offer that states it's subject to lawyer's review and receiving a status certificate and the documents of the corporation. Now that declaration and those documents and the uh, status certificate and the financials will give your lawyer a view of what's going on in that building. Okay, as far as the financial aspect and the rules and regulations of the building. Okay, so there's, there's three things that are involved with condominiums. One would be your declaration, which basically says how the entire building operates. The fiduciary duties of the board, different areas within the building, the budgets, and so on and so on. The thing is, is that this condominium document, the declaration, it is, I would say, minimal, over 100 pages long. Here, I've got one here in front of me. I will take a look. 232 pages. I have one right here in front of me of a condo corporation. So it's 230 pages. And if I give you an overview of the uh, page, of the first page, from pages A1 to A2 is your certificate of insurance for that corporation. Then you have, because this particular building has what's called a shared, so it's not just one building, it's two buildings that are working together 
and they have a common area, which is the underground parking, maybe the lobbies, you know, maybe party rooms and so on. So that, of course, is another certificate of insurance because you have to make sure that the whole building, including the shared area between the two buildings, is covered. So that's another page. Then you have roughly about five pages of your operating budget, which means it's no different if you own a house. You write down exactly how much does it cost you to run this house per month. So it's no different. It's just a condominium is just a larger scale of a budget because it's a bigger property. It's got more things that you have to take a look at. Then this condo document includes your financial statements. The declaration then will out, outline all of the rules, everything that's going on with the condominium complex. And then, of course, you have what's called your bylaws. So you may have anywhere from one, two, three, four, five different bylaws. Sometimes the boards will move forward and change the bylaws, but they have to change it in compliance to the Condo Act. You know, certainly bylaws are coming under a lot of scrutiny right now because the changes that can be made with bylaws are either done by vote in person or they're done by proxy. So we're going to get into that as well with the proxy problem. So after that, you have your reserve fund study, which dictates, and we're going to talk more about reserve fund study. So if you want to make notes here, you want to write it down. You could put certificate of insurance as one, operating budget is two, financial statements is three, what a declaration is, is for rules, bylaws, reserve fund study. And then there's going to be, you know, maybe miscellaneous types of things, okay? Uh, it could be transferred to shared Unix access, key fobs, you know, getting in and out of the building and so on. But if you have that as an overview, that will give you an idea of what a condo document would be including. That's just sort of an overview. So again, if you need that, it's your certificate of insurance for both, the operating budget, financial statement, your declaration overall, the rules, the bylaws, the reserve fund, and basically, you know, the latter pages. That would actually take you to roughly about 200 plus pages. And then after that, very minimal on access control and so on. So when we do the breakdown... And I'm trying not to be, I mean, it is, it is a very hot topic. And unfortunately, I will tell you that if I took a guess, I would have to say, and it's very unfortunate, that, you know, maybe 90% of condo owners, may, maybe, okay, I'll go a little bit lighter. I'll go lighter, okay? I would say 80% of condo owners probably have not taken time to either read the Condo Act or actually even read their condo documents. That's what, from all of the responses that are coming into COA, we are getting inundated with complaints and, and problems. Inundated. And such simple questions that could be answered, even from the condo document, we are receiving by email. The fact that this is what's happening out there, we would have to believe that, you know, when people are purchasing a condo, they probably don't even know that a condo act exists. And they most likely receive those, uh, you know, on brand new construction. They, they receive their eight pages of their agreement of purchase and sale. And, you know, once they secure the deal and they know that they bought the property and they receive this um, declaration, this 230 pages, which, of course, they're being told, you know, you should take this to the lawyer to read, to find out what it is that you've just bought or what's going on about it. How many people actually take it home, sit down and read it? And then even if they do read it, can they understand it? And what key points should they actually look at and pay attention to and really, truly understand enough so that there's a degree of consumer protection when they're out there and purchasing this product? So the condo document really is, is important. And for anyone out there, if you are a condo owner, after this show, stop. <laughs> go into your cabinets, wherever you're keeping them. Just familiarize yourself with it. Scan through it. That's a start. The fact that you know you've got one and the fact that you know that it has to be in compliance to the Condo Act, which again is the Provincial Condominium Act of 1998, that's a start. 
so now let's go back to it. So your certificate of insurance, uh, the certificate of insurance, and those are the two top items. What is a certificate of insurance? The certificate of insurance basically states that this condominium building has insurance. It states the coverage of the insurance. What kind of coverage do you have? Remember, you know, a lot of these condominium buildings, for a matter, are, are worth like well over $80 million. And then, of course, you have reconstruction costs. So you may have condominium insurance within your own personal unit, which covers your personal belongings and so on. But what about the common areas of the building? I mean, this building needs insurance. So that in certificate of insurance will have the state there with respect to the liability part of the insurance. It'll have the deductible part of the insurance. It'll outline, you know, who the insurance company is. Sometimes with buildings, it's, it's split. Today, insurance companies today, not all insurance companies will take 100% of the actual building. They'll share together with another insurance company. But either way, that certificate of insurance will basically make sure you as a condo owner know that that building has insurance and that, the, that uh, you know, it's stamped, it's up to date, the policy has been paid and approved by the board of directors, which is the governing body that you've elected to run the affairs of your corporation, which is your building. So that insurance is very important because if you don't have insurance, you've lost everything. So I, I mentioned a little bit about the second part of an insurance. You know, nowadays, a lot of these new buildings out there, what they're doing is, is that they're, they're building differently. They're not just necessarily building one building. They're, they're building sister buildings. So building number one and the building number two. In the long haul, it does help to save money. There's no question about that. Because, you know, a lot of these amenities, there's no point to put in an Olympic-sized swimming pool if you've only got one building with 350 residents in there. A lot of times, these different amenities honestly don't get used. And they're expensive. They're not, they're not cheap to operate. And I will say to you that if that swimming pool is up on the 15th floor, it's wonderful that it's up on the 15th floor. But there is a stronger risk level because don't forget, if that pool has a leak, it's going to affect an awful lot of residents underneath, all, all of the units underneath it. So there's two ways to have rec centers and so on. One is a separate entity where they've actually built on the lands, but they haven't put it right in the building. It's a separate entity, and both buildings have access, either through underground or, or however the access or the hallways or however the access is going to be. They're a little bit more protective because they're, they're, they, they're standalone you know, as far as, as being an influence on whether or not it could actually cause damage within the building. But those, those complexes are expensive, and they're expensive to run. But what they are is they're shared facilities. So they're a shared facility between the buildings. And that could be one or two or three or four buildings. I know that there's a complex downtown Toronto, and there's six buildings that actually use that one complex. And the complex is out of this world. I mean, it's got... Um, it's got a bowling alley. <laughs> it's got an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It's, it has practically everything that you would want to have, even in a gym environment. But it is costly. And the undergrounds, of course, have to extend over to the facility to create a much easier access for all the condominiums that are involved that are sharing this facility. So that is one entity. And here in Mississauga, we actually, we actually have the same kind of an idea as well. Up in the square one area, there's a number of buildings that have that shared facility complex. And actually, even other areas within Mississauga has the same. So it's a very popular, and, and I'm not saying that it's not a bad decision. It's an excellent decision because it does share on costs. But it does require all the boards from all the buildings to work together. That's what it requires. And that is extremely important. So we're going to get more involved with uh, shared facilities and understanding that concept because a lot of people don't understand that. So it's Linda Pinizzato of The Condo Expert, and I'm speaking to you here from the station at the Hayes FM. So please stay tuned. We're going to deal with a series of topics relating to condominium documents, Condominium Act. This is an educational period for everyone out there in the province of Ontario. Thank you.